Could I take you back to New Philadelphia 160 years ago from where we are today? August of 1857, James Buchanan was the 15th president of the United States at that time. It was three years before the Civil War began. It was two years before Abraham Lincoln became president of the United States. And there were, check this out, 44 more years remaining in the greatest period of church history, the Philadelphian church period. And in August of 1857, again, 160 years ago, do you realize there was not a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching Baptist church in New Philadelphia or Tuscross County, for that matter, but in a little town called New Hagerstown? It was a kind of an up-and-coming little town. There was a, a school of higher learning that was there. And there was a Bible-believing Baptist church that was there. In those days, there was a stagecoach that ran from New Hagerstown to New Philadelphia. And so the two towns had that connection. And in that Baptist church in New Hagerstown, the leaders in that church began to dream about and began to pray about planting a church in New Philadelphia, Ohio. And in 1858, March of 1858, it happened. They planted what we now know and love as the first Baptist church. This church still preaches the gospel to see people come to Christ. It still preaches the Bible to see people built up in their faith. It still seeks to make disciples right here in Tuscarawas County and to the uttermost part of the earth. It seeks to perfect men and women for the work of the ministry. And to all of that, y'all, I say, to God be the glory. Hello there. This is Wayne Dillabaugh, the associate pastor of the First Baptist Church of New Philadelphia, Ohio. We hope you will enjoy this record because we've gone to the expense of having it professionally produced so that we can share with you the exciting things God is doing at our church through our people. We hope you will sit back and relax and enjoy the inspiring music of the First Baptist Choir and the Sunday Night Singers. My name is Art Taylor, and I was born in 1933, which makes me 84. I came to First Baptist Church in 1971, and I think that comes out about 47 years. I'm Wanda Schlafly. I'm 91 years old, and I came to First Baptist Church in 1946. Marjorie Ellen Harstein. I was born 83 and years and nine months ago, and I've been in First Baptist ever since I was about two weeks old. Well, my great grandmother was baptized and joined the church in, I think it was 1887 or something like that. 
and then they were married in, in church. My parents were married, well, my dad was raised in the church. His whole family came here, and um, he was married in January of 1918. My name is Carl Warner, and I've been coming here for 68 years. I started in 1949 when I was eight years old, and I had a 16-year-old cousin come down one afternoon on her bicycle and asked me if I'd go to Sunday school with her. And uh, she came down and picked me up Sunday morning and we came to Sunday school. And uh, I enjoyed it. And the next Sunday rolled around and I said, Mom, can I go back to Sunday school? She said, sure. And we lived on the corner of Sixth and Ray in New Philly. And of course the church was down on Second Fair. So for the next couple of years, I walked by myself to Sunday school every Sunday. It, it was right across from the jail for one thing. So you, people would say, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to the Baptist church. Oh, you live over, you go over the church by the jail. Just like Mayberry, you literally could see the bars and the windows and the, the prisoners would be have their hands on the bars just looking at you. And it just it kind of freaked me out as like, as a little kid, you know. We also owned a laundromat behind it, um, that, which is weird, and then a, a house. Um, a house that we actually used because we outgrew the building, we used the house for different classes and stuff. Sunday school back in that day was not held in the church. There was an old house next door to the church and we went out the side door of the church into the side door of the old house and was in rooms throughout the house the church had bought. The main auditorium would hold about oh, three, four hundred people and it was just two outside aisles and one aisle down the center. And then when we built the wing on, we built seating off to the side. It was sort of like a, in an opera, sitting parallel with the aisles to where you had to look at the pastor this way to get more seating. And they were probably about six rows deep on each side. singing church. There, um, we had a men's quartet, women's quartet, a wonderful choir, and um, we did cantatas and it was just a singing church. When they, they started WJER, they went on with the, our family alder from quarter to eight to eight o'clock every Monday through Friday. Uh, Martha Reynolds used to play the organ Wanda Slafley sang a lot on that program. The theme song was Precious Lord Take My Hand, and uh, so everybody in Tuscarawas County heard that. I was here every morning to sing Precious Lord Take My Hand. Lead me on, let me stand. I'm tired, I'm weak, I'm worn. Through the storms of the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. And that has been my theme song through my lifetime because from the time I was 20, I would ask the Lord to take my hand that day. That sings my soul, my Savior God today. How great thou art, how great thou art. And sings my soul. One thing I'll never forget is when we were preparing to um, to buy this land and and to um, to go out by faith and and do what God wanted. Um, we always sang every single Sunday. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. I want that mountain where the milk and honey flow, where the grapes of Eshul grow. I want that mountain, I want that mountain, the mountain that my Lord has given me. I think, I think the Lord brought Pastor Hunt here to move us down here, to negotiate the sale of this property and to build this building, because he was really good at that. 
And I did a lot of work down here with this, with Jack Salzner and the boys. With the ice carrying block for Jack. He was doing the mudding and leveling, and it was a, it was great fun. Uh, yeah, it was a big transition. Uh, everybody looked forward to it. Of course, when the the original building here, when you stepped inside the main doors, you were in a hallway right outside the auditorium. There was no area. You know, that was all added on. This is the house that Jack built, and every time I would come to come to in front of this church, I thought of Jack Selzner because this is the house that Jack built, and Jack didn't just physically build this church. You could come in this church anytime when he was working here and find Jack Selzner on his knees and Warren Schlafly on their knees. Warren would come in to put in some plumbing and he thanked God for his job. He thanked God for his pastor. He thanked God for his family. And he thanked you for this, this place. And so I don't worship this church building, but I know that God is here because this is the house that Jack Salzner and Warren Slavely built physically. And I love it like I love my home, and that makes it very precious to me. It's like coming home. We'd like to challenge each person who hears this record to make sure you have received God's gift of eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible promises that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that includes you. If you've never asked Christ to save you and give you the free gift of eternal life, do so now. It will be the best decision of your life. Anybody that you talk to, no matter what their religious affiliation was, uh, it, and they'd say, where do you go to church? And we'd say, First Baptist down on South Side. Oh, the He Lives sign. Mottos were out big back in that time. Um, they still are. I mean, you get it in your head and you think of it. And when you see He Lives, you wonder, I'm an unsafe person, who is it lives? And they'll ask you a question, who lives? and then you get a chance to give the gospel. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about So the best ministry was between uh, 1972 and uh, somewhere in the late 90s. And in those days, we had 15 buses that brought in between 400 and 500 people. These bus drivers would go on Saturday, and every Saturday went on the, did their bus route. They went and knocked on that door and said to the parents, I will be picking her up at a certain time tomorrow. Be sure she's ready. She'll need her Bible, and we'll take really good care of her. And the parents knew that that bus driver was gonna come. There was a bus, no, two guys came to our house. And they wanted to know if we had children and if they would like to ride the uh, church bus and come to church. And we wasn't, I don't think we were going to church at that time. And we, so then we thought about it and Bill said, you know what? Uh, no, we won't put them on the bus. We'll just come and bring the kids with us. So then that's when we started. Before I come out here, I was working at Great Hall, and I was making quite a bit of money down there, and uh, I wanted to do something for the Lord. So the associate pastor under Hunt, Wayne Dillaball, asked me if I'd work full time for the church. And I agreed with him, I said yes. That's and a lot of people tried to talk me out of it. You're not going to be making much money. I said, I'm depending on the Lord to take care of my needs. And he provided. And he did. He provided for us. So he drove the bus. He, we got it. He drove the bus. And I was like the helper with mm -hmm. all the kids. We had usually around 30. 
And so I took care of the kids while he drove. And we had a little gift for them. If it was nothing more than a sucker when they left, we gave them something and we gave them a scripture verse. We'd teach them the scripture verses so that they could say it. And we would say, now tell your parents when you get home what you learned. Every Sunday we go home, there'd be buses sitting along the road with four kids broke down. And I kept saying to her, I don't know why they don't fix them old junk buses. <laughs> and I did that for three or four months. Finally, one day on the way home, she said, you're a mechanic, why don't you fix them? But the Lord started working in my heart and my life. And, and uh, early part of 84, or late part of 84, I came here to work as a mechanic taking care of the buses and stuff. One weekend, um, a tornado came over the hill and basically landed on the west wing of our church. It missed the barn completely and just come over and hovered over the church, took the roof off the gym, uh, the office society over there and the school and all that. I mean, it, the rain just poured in and it ruined everything. When we first heard about it, it was we were devastated. We came down here when there was still a foot or two of water in, this, in the auditorium and mud everywhere and tiles from the roof laying all over the parking lot. Your heart just dropped down in your ankles, you know, and you, the place that you grew used to, you know, you knew where every nook and cranny was at and everything and everything was this water knee deep, you know, in, in the... Ceiling tiles all over the floor and, and, and the mess. Anything that was, the water would uh, penetrate was just ruined, you know, so. I don't think anybody that was attending here would forget that. I know the water was three foot deep down at the, uh, from the auditorium. That's just when I took over head usher right after that. We met at New Philly High School and, uh, uh, I don't recall how long, but until we got the place repaired and you know, able to inhabit again in the gymnasium, on the bleachers, and our services were held at the high school. People would say, we're, do we're doing so much good, we're reaching so many people for God. Why? Why, God, did this happen? It was costly. And so the pastor said, that it will be a blessing in disguise. And we believe that, that God does make a mistake. And somehow people had more work, people had more time to give. God blessed us in so many ways that when the whole job was over, we thought, well, what can we do now? Everybody pitched in every evening and Fred Hartsford was coming here and he had J&J &J Refuge and he'd put big hoppers out back and five or six of them every night, everybody would just come and work and clean up and get rid of all the debris and put in them hoppers. My dad was still living then and I can remember coming up with crews, wrecking crews and tearing all the drywall down to uh, rebuild the walls after the storm. And then there were a lot of people, a lot of carpenters, uh, woodworkers, plumbers, and different people that were in the church, older people and younger people, that were helped doing a lot of the work. Yeah, you look at the building and you thought, it's a total loss, it, you know, they'll tear it down, but it so happened to be we had good leaders in the church, good deacons at that time, and good leadership, and it all worked out for for the glory of God. But everyone was so sad because we're in the middle of a huge building program. And then, um, you know, then this happens, the tornado. But the amazing part was the people of this church um, just rallied like never before. And 
and everybody like pitched in and folks that own businesses would would do this and do that and it was incredible to me and it was it was over a two million dollar expansion and when it was all done um, there was uh, when we had all the commitments there was still six or seven hundred thousand dollars and that's a huge amount of money for back then and uh, wouldn't you know that when the insurance claim came through it was enough to pay off the entire building program and that as a little kid just increased my faith like crazy and um, it was it was something I'll never forget the rest of my life I think this church has really made a difference when I went into the discipleship program being able to equip people to understand what they know and how to use it. People come more more active. You are not just here to fill a pew. Uh, the church is a lot more interactive since we've had discipleship. We were tighter knit. It made us all connected more. I mean, we were always a friendly uh, church and community, you know, family. But this even made us more tightly knit together. After discipleship got started, people got to know one another, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, made a big difference in uh, people's lives. It seemed like there was so much more of interest in people that you might not have known, you know, that well before. So it just, it just, I think, made us a tighter group. Now, with discipleship and everything, it's become more a part of people's lives. Well, when I came home then, when I came home, I realized that the Christian life was an ongoing thing. You continue to grow and, you know, you didn't sit, you got involved. One of the things that we have to realize that Christianity is not, it's a personal relationship. There are no grandchildren in Christianity. It's not who your parents are, it's who your relationships with. And that's something that we really need to keep emphasizing that, you know, we personally have to make a decision. We don't, if our parents are Christians, that doesn't make us a Christian. Each new day comes and goes. When I wake up in the morning, I always just ask the Lord, what would you have me to do? You don't have to do great things, do small things with love, and the Lord blesses. And I think that's why First Baptist Church is still here. There's joy in it. When I pull up to the front of the church, 91 years old every Sunday, somebody comes out and parks my car, and then it, when church is over, they have my car right out in front because they don't want me to fall down at 91. And it's a giving church. We give what we can. If it's a seat in the church, we have it for them. Whatever need, be it small or large, we meet that need because God gave us the ability to do that. The people make the church, and then the right pastor or preacher, whatever you want to call him, is God's disciple that feeds us, and we want to come back. It's a place you want to come to. It's not, oh, we got to go to church again on Sunday. You know, we don't do that. We say, are you ready yet? <laughs> the best part is to be involved in the life groups because it's when you're in the small groups that you get to know people. Otherwise, you just get to know the people that are sitting around you. But when you get involved in a small life group, then you, you know, you become, you're studying things together and doing things together and you get to know them and get more involved. Not only because you're right, this is a family, this is our church that God has built and we're willing to stand by him and stand by this building and everything it stands for. This church has always preached truth through all these decades that God has honored that and has been able to give us the foresight to choose the pastors we needed at the time and get us through whatever we were going through at the time. Some problems. There's always a problem yeah. going on in your family, you know? Even your own family. 
you have problems. But you know, but God, you can work them out if you trust God. It's a piece of cake. We go back to uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Did Jesus run there the first time he heard about Lazarus being sick? Why? He he didn't. Then he hesitated there a couple of days, and then he went. He finally got there. When he got there, Lazarus had been buried for four days. Now, why did he do that? He did that to prove to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, and the other people who he really was. So sometimes he got to beat us over the head so we'll say, God, you are God. And that's where our faith comes from. When the roof blowed off and the water and all the buildings, mud and everything here, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? And he comes along and solves it all. Raising your kids in this church is going to be one of the easiest tasks and helps you'll ever have in life. I have got five sons I'll match up against anybody that were raised by this church, by Sunday school teachers, and uh, have turned out outstanding. And I give a lot of credit to the direction that I got from, you know, Sunday school teachers as an adult, and the teachers that invested in my children and in camp uh, has really rewarded me in life. I often say that about teaching, but I'll say it about coming to church too. It's not what I do, it's who I am. That's just what I am. I'm just a common 91-year-old lady who loves God and loves people in this church. You're my family. Savior. 